Uh, welcome. The event today is designed to help you learn about innovative new open source solutions for impact measurement and funding. Um, the event is supported by an award from the Filecoin uh, Foundation for the Decentralized Web. My name is Billy Bickett. I'm the head of Maker Labs at TechSoup. I'll be your event host. This event is hosted by our organization, TechSoup, uh, which is based in San Francisco. We have offices in London and Warsaw. And we've been doing this work since 1987. We're a mission-based nonprofit social enterprise. And we believe that technology can be bent for the greater good. And we host these demo events because we're really incredibly inspired by the makers who are building new tools to benefit communities. Today's event partner is Funding the Commons. And we're super stoked to have our friends from Funding the Commons here co-presenting with them. Oreen Iodel is partnering with us to produce this event. Oreen has worked at the intersection of impact and entrepreneurship and small, and she's an SME for the last five years and the program manager at Funding the Commons and Earth Commons, focused on impact measurement of public goods and climate. Oreen, I'd like you to share a, a few words about what you're doing and anything you'd like to share with the audience. Hi, everyone. My name is Uri, and as Billy kindly introduced me as, I work at Funding the Commons and Earth Commons. Um, Funding the Commons and Earth Commons were both incubated um, under Protocol Labs. So what we do at Funding the Commons is very much focused on building new models of sustainable public goods funding and value alignment in open source networks. So we do that at conferences, hackathon, residencies. And we also try to focus on bridging the public goods community across Web 2, Web 3, research, philanthropy, and industry. And our sister brand, Earth Commons, is very much focused on building bridges between climate entrepreneurs, academics, technologists, exploring the funding and governance of nature's commons. Some events we um, have put on have been FTC and Earth Commons that took place in Berkeley um, earlier this year that was focused on web. And we had speakers such as at Earth Commons, such as Atosa Saltani, Lynn Twist, Stuart Cohen from Buckmeister Fuller Institute. And so we will also have um, a few other events happening this year in Switzerland, Tokyo, and Bangkok, because for us, it's very important to go around the world and really see what is happening in local communities and what are their solutions to some of our pressing problems and in the public good space. If you want to know more information about it, you can always check out fundingthecommons.io or follow us on Twitter at Funding the Commons or Earth Commons. So looking forward to hearing some of the work that some of our partners are doing. Thank you so much, Oreen. With enough of a prelude on logistics, let me now jump into the, the good juicy stuff that we came here for. We've got three excellent speakers today who are building tools to advance impact measurement First, we've got Raymond Chang from the Open Source Observer. He's got free free analytics suite that offers a promising model for measuring the impact of contributions to the health of an ecosystem. And then there are potential applications for nonprofits, which he'll speak to then in his talk. Ken, Ken Beckers is here. He's working on HyperCerts, a new protocol for funding and rewarding positive impact. And Laura Navarro is here from Metric Guards, Garden Labs developing tools to measure the soft contributions of a community beyond code. Metric Garden Labs is exploring new dimensions of impact assessment. I'll share a, a more deep dive bio on folks as we introduce each of them. They'll speak for five to seven minutes about what they're working on, and then we'll do Q and A. We'll wrap up at the top of the hour. And so with that, let's move into Raymond's uh, demo. Uh, I'm going to do a little bio on Raymond. Uh, Raymond has one of the most fascinating bios on the internet. Uh, if you type uh, his name and what he's working on, I, he, his bio is so interesting that I had to stop what I was doing when I read it and called my wife and said, sweetie, check this out. So Raymond is an engineer, software engineer, entrepreneur, research scientist with a passion for improving 
internet experiences. He's contributed to distributed systems and security, including data privacy and blockchains. Uh, he co-founded Oasis Labs and created a networking project adopted by Google. His work's been recognized uh, globally in publications like Forbes and Wired and on platforms like NBC. He holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington and degrees in physics, electrical engineering, and computer science from MIT. His projects are used by millions, reflecting his impact on the tech industry. He also does break dancing and many other things, as far as I can recall, or rap. I think he's a rapper, Raymond, correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, super stoked to have you, Raymond. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic to you and move the slides forward for you as we go. My name is Raymond. And today I want to talk to you about Open Source Observer, which is a tool that we've been building for measuring open source uh, software, particularly, and any of the software ecosystem around open source, which today really is all software. The way that we think about it is that every single software ecosystem is a financial problem. And open source is part of that ecosystem. And it's something that is underinvested today. And one of the things that we want to think about is how can we better place investments into open source software to maximize the ROI of that investment? And ROI in this case, obviously does not necessarily come in the form of financial return because open source software is meant to be freely shared and freely distributed around the world. It's really about maximizing the impact that we have on society and society leverages already open source software in such incredible ways. Recent studies have shown that over 90% of companies use open source in some way, over 76% of lines of code that ship to production, whether you're a small startup or a large company in Fortune 500, a pretty large majority of software that ships to production today is actually open source software. And we want to be able to provide data solutions that help allocators when they invest in open source software, maximize that impact. And one way to think about it is like Moneyball for open source software. If you've seen the movie, basically we want to take a data-driven approach to change the way that we allocate money to open source today, where, you know, historically the way that we've funded open source has been a lot more discretionary, a lot more ad hoc, and typically lacking a systemic level, broader picture view of how do we how we're making impact. So we're helping these internet economies measure the impact of open source software. One of the directions that we're currently focusing on right now is crypto networks. One of the reasons why we're focusing on crypto networks today is because we know that they're investing a lot of money into open source software. There's on the order of a hundred million dollars a year that's currently being distributed two different open source projects in that ecosystem. At the top of the funnel, or in terms of inputs into the economy, that's incredible. It's generating a lot of developer activity. And one of the things that's really interesting about crypto networks is that all the user analytics for applications are typically also open source. So we can measure the impact all the way out to the number of users that it's touching, predominantly because any of the products that are built in the crypto space are built on top of the blockchain, which means we can analyze that in the open alongside any of our other data sources. But of course, our ambitions are much greater than that. These types of methodologies of how we think about ROI and how we think about funding allocation should be able to be applied to other forms of public public goods around the internet, including in traditional Web2 companies or any other company that's leveraging open source. But this is where we're starting because the data is so available. And this tends to be, at least in the crypto space, what most funding allocators are maximizing for. On one dimension, they want to see the number of users go up. On the other dimension, the number of developers and the health of the ecosystem in terms of active contribution also go up. So everybody's trying to go up and to the right here. That's not, again, not too different from many other ecosystems that exist. Think about machine learning, think about data science, think about, yeah, any kind of emerging tech. We typically want to be growing that ecosystem improving productivity and developer velocity for those users or for those developers, trying to retain high quality developers in that ecosystem, but more importantly, helping those developers with open source software build, be more productive and build better software, better products for users to basically grow that economy. Not that different than any other ecosystem, just in crypto, it tends to be a different set of libraries that, that they focus on. It's an opportunity partly because we know that there's so much money that is about to be deployed in crypto networks. So we estimate that there's about $30 billion that's going to go into crypto ecosystems over the next several decades. These are sitting in ecosystem treasuries. And as I mentioned earlier, there's on the order of about $100 million a year that's currently going out predominantly towards, towards software. So how do you, how do we best 
um, allocate that money to drive growth in the smartest way is critically important for making sure that the ecosystem succeeds. Our most recent partnership was with a company, uh, or sorry, with an ecosystem of Optimism. They did what they call the retro PGF round, which basically means that they are trying to fund the most impactful project to their ecosystem with 30 million OP tokens that at that time was over a hundred million dollars. They had over 500 projects that were involved in this round, over a hundred voters and their decentralized governance mechanism that they were using to basically collectively try to decide what was the highest impact to these projects and which projects were highest impact to the ecosystem. And through that work, we were basically measuring all sorts of different things, including how the, how through that funding, we we're growing the pool of full-time developers and how more developers can now sustain themselves based on this funding. We're also measuring things like how integral are they to the open source community? How deeply rooted are they in the dependency tree? How many projects are depending on them? How beloved are they by developer? As well as going all the way downstream. What we care about is not just how much money is going in, but also how much, how many developers are being incentivized by this work. What kind of, where these developers are producing software in the software supply chain. And then ultimately how many users does this software ultimately cut on the bottom? That's what this Victor 7 is trying to, trying to illuminate, which is how much activity are actually, are we actually driving in the products and services that are built on top of this network? And how do we understand each one of these layers to, to drive higher conversion and higher return on that funding? This is just an early exploration. We're now starting to basically expand and go further in depth in this exploration with particularly on-chain activity. We want to be able to understand typical product health related questions, for example, which are the highest quality users? What's the LTV of any particular user or what type value? How much does it cost to acquire one of these users into the network? And which developers are bringing the highest value to the network and the highest, uh, the highest value users to the network. This is all of what we're doing. I should mention, I don't have a slide for this, but all of this is open source. And we've committed to building everything in open source observer to be open source, open data, open infrastructure. That's one of the things that's quite different compared to other business intelligence or data science kind of tooling. We want to do this entirely with an, with an open community. All of our data pipelines are in our open source repository, we accept contributions from all over, and we're excited to basically evolve this data pipeline with the community to better create metrics and analytics and insights that help drive better decisions. There are all sorts of ways to both contribute, get involved, but also consume the data. I welcome you to check out our documentation page. There are ways for folks to connect indexing infrastructure to contribute regular data streams to the data set. There's ways to propose impact models or data models in our data pipeline to help transform that data to a way that's most useful. There's different ways to share your insight if you're learning new things based on this data to uh, drive better decision-making. And we also have regular data challenges for folks who want to just dabble their feet and potentially be eligible for some prizes and in, in, in some of their contributions. So we have an API, but we also have public data sets in Google BigQuery right now, and we're looking to expand the ways that different people can leverage this data in different ways. We're most excited about how do we improve the state of funding towards open, towards open source software and public goods in general. So I, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to check out our Telegram community, follow us on GitHub, or check out our documentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Raymond. Okay. We're going to, we're going to move to the next speaker and, and do Q and A at the end. Of course, if you have questions in real time, feel free to hit up this up in the chat. So next up is Ken Bitbeckers Beckers from HyperCert. Ken is the core developer of the, uh, HyperCert's foundation, a member of Raid Guild DAO, public nouns and, uh, other DAOs as a web three product developer, Ken's focused on building tooling for, and on top of impact funding networks. HyperCerts is a new protocol for funding and rewarding positive impact. So we'll let Ken talk us through what HyperCerts is all about and why it's relevant to you. Ken, it's all yours. So I'm Ken Bitbeckers, as you can probably hear. I'm located in the Netherlands. I'm Dutch. I'm a developer, but today I'm going to talk mostly about the HyperCerts Foundation. The HyperCerts Foundation is an organization that actually spun out of Protocol Labs. We've been ra we've raised, I think like a year and a half ago, or actually established a foundation. We're f focusing on 
closing the value loop between funders and impact creators. Uh, next, please. The reason why we're focusing on funding and closing the, the impact loop is that currently there are a bunch, there are a lot of projects and groups in the world that are very dependent on funding from either private or public orgs. I've saw, I've seen a humbling list of organizations in the chat. So feel free to reach out to me after this meeting. The challenge that we see and that we want to try to solve for is that when you look at funding there, there's the sending of the, like the donating of the funds from the funders towards the impact creators, but it doesn't really have a feedback loop or not often. So you might give a grant, but you're not really sure what you're going to get back for the grant or as a grant recipient, it might even be very challenging to get access to these grants because these grants are, for instance, controlled by centralized bodies, or it's a very select group, or it's actually a group on the other end of the world that has like a, a gazillion difficulties to get the funds to the other side of the world, or maybe even to trust that the people on the other end of the world will actually do with grant funds that they want to do. So what we do at Hypers Foundation is that we utilize blockchain technology and decentralized tech to build an ecosystem for these impact funding networks. Be because we rely heavily on blockchain, that means that most information that we use is public and transparent and everybody can inspect this. It also enables us to easily send funds from one place to another, which you can also, you can add checks and balances in the funds, in, in the grant giving. And the checks and balances can even be very transparent. So in, the, in my ecosystem where I live, we have a lot of NGOs, a lot of public good organizations, but they're not all successful. Not all of them are doing what they're saying, but it's really difficult to validate or see what they're actually doing because nobody can see anybody else's bank account. But if you want to say, I'm working with public funds, you might want to have a public ledger of what's happening with those public funds. And this is what we, the, what blockchain technology enables. Next, please. The. Challenges, and I alluded to them already. I'm going to talk about the challenges of impact funding, and then I'm going to describe how we are building the tech stack or building the ecosystem to solve for these problems. Next, please. On the, on the one hand, I think, a lot, I think many people that are here in this meeting or in this session are part of this group, which are contributors that invest time and resources in impactful work. You build open source software. You empower local communities. You, you set up activities for the environment, like a beast cleaning. Maybe you do just do community events. Maybe you do a soup kitchen or maybe you steward over a piece of land or anything else. These are all things that I think if you look at, let's say the, the classical economy, they might not be valued highly because they have very low financial gain, capital gain, but they do have a lot of like social capital, environmental capital, spiritual capital, or any other form of capital. So they do have value, but they do not necessarily get dollars or euros or wherever you are. Then on the other hand, we, on the other side, we have the impact funders. So we have the public organization like governance or municipalities. We have NGOs. I think that like where I'm from, Oxfam Nobud is very, Oxfam Nobud is well known. We have altruism. We have Bill Gates. We have all other different kinds of people that are willing to give away funds. Similar, even like in my context, the European Union, what I here in the environments that I deal with is that it's really difficult to determine who you're going to give the funds to. So usually what people try to do is optimize the impact of the funding that they're giving to be sure that people will do with the funds that they expect you to do. But it's really hard then to get access to funds without having the reputation of being reputable or trustworthy. By building the hard system, we're trying to build these three, two groups together. We want to close the value loop where people want to establish impact and people want to fund these positive kinds of impact. And we want to take away these barriers for them to send funds from one party to another. Because if you just, yeah. So, because if you get funds away, everybody's happy, right? You can do grant fundings and that's great. So, but this raises a bunch of questions, right? Who's building the code? Are they really getting paid? Are they really the developers? How can you claim that you are the developer? What is really the impact? Are you just saying that you're doing something? How were they selected? Right? Is it nepotism? It was there like a committee? Was there anything in between? Was it a public process? Was it a private process? And I'm not trying to 
frame like we have a judgment on this. What I'm trying to explain is that all of these questions, we can try to figure out how we can build systems that can solve some of these answers. If you want to choose for a public of a private, private process, either can be fine, but you should have the option, right? You shouldn't be submitted to some private, private process because that's the only way that you can get funds. So this is what we do with hypercerts. Hypercerts, the ecosystem is basically a triangle of three major components. And I think actually most of these components are also in this room as uh, experts today. So we have hypercerts, that's a protocol that I created or that we created thanks to funding from a lot of orgs that want to fund these public good infrastructures. Hypercerts are basically an on-chain registry of impact. We tokenize impact where people can say, this is what I did. This is who I am. This is what I think our impact is. And that's it. So a hypersearch, you can view it as a claim in, a, in and of itself. Then on the other side, we bring the evaluators that can attest to this. And then we have the marketplace and enables marketing mechanics. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into these three um, parties. Like I already said, hypersearch are claims of who did what and when. So here you see a small selection of hypersearch that have been created. Most of them are open source software, for instance, BrightID facilitates proof of uniqueness, which enables things like UBI and grant giving, but because we at least want to know that you're unique, so you can double dip into your UBI ecosystem. There's Ethers, that's very important for the Ethereum ecosystem, same as Autoscan, and then there's a solar foundation that's actually trying to raise funds to build these solar power grids, and then the solar power grids, they can um, be more monetized and raise funds again for the local communities that they're established in. So if the hypothesis are unchained, it means that they're public. And this is like one set of these public, and this is like one of the public data sets. So this is the amount of hypothesis that has been created, I think, two or three months ago. We had 50, almost 55,000 of these certificates. There's a lot of numbers here. Just focus on the 55,000 and then a diagram in the bottom right corner. So you see these blue peaks. These blue peaks were certain funding rounds that have been done in our ecosystem. And then suddenly you get this red wave. This red wave is because there was some sort of announcement that somebody created the idea that you could monetize having a hypercert at that moment. So you just see that like a lot of people start creating these hypercerts, right? And this is exactly the reason why we need evaluators in your ecosystem. Evaluators help us to discern which hypercerts are true or false, right? Because anybody can make the same claim. But we want to know which of these claimers is actually the true one. And then still, even if they are the true claimer, is what they are claiming actually happening. The evaluators can still be anybody, but some will be trusted more based on reputation or expertise. And I think this is simply how things work. But I think the power, that we, the power of the system that we try to build is that anybody can be an evaluator. So you can bring your own piece of expertise or your own piece of knowledge. You can even say, Hey, somebody claimed I planted 500 trees or somebody claimed they planted 500 trees, but I live there and there are no trees, right? So you're not, you're no longer flow, you're no longer close in to these, let's say Vera, that's the, the gold standard for some sort of credential system. Next. So now, because we have these claims and we know which one are more truthy, we can loop in funders and then say, hey, we have this whole set of claims. We have all these things that people have been doing all over the world. These have been validated. These are mostly validated and these are contested. What well, would you find anything to fund? And that, that's then what we try to enable. Maybe this is very confusing. Maybe I'm going all over the place, but I think this is one simple example. This is like my, my prime example on what are we really trying to build? So we built the infrastructure, right? So we create the claims, we, we support evaluators, we build the marketplace. This is voice deck and what they, with the help of grants, they established a marketplace for journalistic impact in India. Because in India, the, the, the main source of income for journalists or like the second source of income is actually Bollywood, like the, the based on the true story narrative, but it also means that a lot of things that are very impactful in a country of that size are not being funded. But by creating these hypersters with all these cards that you see, they create a report of the work that has been done, the impact that has been reported, and you actually get newspapers attached to them. So you, you can see that this happened. Then you see these bars that are like a Kickstarter 
fundraising flow, which is actually the marketplace. And when you would click into these cards, you can actually see the evaluation reports and all the evaluators that attest to this. All the tech that we build underneath is, uh, is simplified to this Kickstarter-like experience. And this is like the key of what we try to build. Um, I put it in there if I would have enough time. I don't think I have. This is like the complex edition of what I just tried to say. Uh, if you have any questions, just reach out to me. Uh, I'm happy to dive into you, uh, into this with you. Uh, so if you want to build, uh, if you want to utilize hypersearch, build on hypersearch, or you just want to know more, I like my, I'm really enthusiastic about working with uh, communities and especially local communities, because I feel in this whole crypto world that we live, we build a lot of like shiny sky castles. Uh, and I really want to bring it to communities that have like a direct impact. So feel free to use out. Thank you so much, Ken. Moving on to our next demo, our guest expert, Laura Launamu Navarro, Metrics Garden Labs. Launamu founded Metrics Garden Labs and has experienced launching and scaling fintech startups in emerging markets such as Branch International and Revolut. Her areas of expertise are operations, product, and strategy. She has been working in impact evaluation in the Web3 space for over a year, building on top of her past Web2 grants experience. So with that, let me introduce Laura. Laura, the mic is yours and the floor is yours. Welcome. I'm really excited to share with you more on the platform that we've been building, which is called Impact Partner. In a nutshell, what we're building is a platform so that you can generate freely accessible and standardized impact data to inform the strategy that impact creators are developing for their own initiatives and for funders that are looking to support these initiatives. As I'm sure you all know, not all impact is created the same and therefore cannot and should it be measured with the same tools. As I, as Kelly mentioned on my intro, I used to work with the Canada Fund and supporting several different NGOs in Mexico so that we could fund tons of different initiatives that they had in the country. And one of the main challenges that we had and that we supported them with was identifying how do they measure what they are contributing in their different lives? And what is the data that's best to be shared with the Canada Fund so that we could do a good assessment and so that we could continue funding them? And we quickly identified that these were all different groups that were trying to achieve different goals and therefore needed different resources and different metrics to measure what is the success that they were having. Right. And it's very important that we have different initiatives that are generating different contribution, contributions because this is all needed for ecosystems and for projects to thrive. As I mentioned, all of these different projects will have different goals. They will have different outputs, different audiences that they're trying to reach or enable. And it is based on this that their positive outcomes can be measured and then evaluated. With the blockchain, ecosystem, we've seen that they've also identified the relevance to fund a diversity of initiatives, ranging from open source software to educational initiatives. Several of this ecosystem have their own governance, so also financing this governance initiatives and for people to learn how to interact with them at a different level, not only the technical one, has become very important. They are dedicating significant resources. As Ray mentioned, Raymond mentioned as well, this is over 3 billion USD that we're talking about that have already been earmarked for this. And it's also very important to mention that context matters. If we go to the Funders and impact generators have target audiences and it is based on their ability to reach them that they can define how successful their strategies have been at generating the impact for those that they care about the most. Often this data doesn't exist or it is built and captured with tools that make it difficult for others to trust it. Please. And it is for that reason that we build Impact Garden. Impact Garden is a platform that enables you to generate unalterable, verifiable, qualitative data on benefits that have been derived from a contribution. We're looking for three different audiences to leverage this data once it has already been created. We're looking for impact generators to use it so that they can improve the work that they are doing. They can 
design better strategies and be more efficient with the resources they have. We know that often impact generators are very strapped on the resources that they have, both in human resources, financial resources, and even attention from their funders and the people that are contributing to their efforts. Uh, so we want to make sure that they are able to do a good work. Uh, there's also users and then the funders. So on our platform, impact generators are able to first claim password um, so that no other person can claim it for them. Second, they're able to receive feedback so that they can use this to inform their strategies and be more efficient when they are allocating their resources. And they can also be rewarded for the work that they've been doing and so that they can continue generating feedback. On our platform, projects and individuals are able to create a profile and they can then include all the past contributions that they've done either to different ecosystems or to different projects and spaces. And on the back side of things, what we're doing is we're registering all of this information on chain so that no one can modify it or reclaim it. People are then able to reference it and verify its authenticity. Then on our second set of our audiences, we've got the users. So when users log in to the platform and register on the platform, they are able to provide context on the value that they've received for contribution. They are going to be able to highlight what was worth their time and what should be done differently. With this information, impact generators are then able to know how efficient their work has been, if their past strategies have been good, and what they need to improve so that they are able to first reach their goal audiences, but also able to take the impact that they are generating to the next level. On the platform, users are able to rate and provide descriptive insights into how they are benefiting from a specific contribution. And through this, they are enriching the data that is available for decision-making, both from impact generators, from funders, and also from other people in their community that might benefit from the contributions that they are already We start creating webs of interconnected information, given that all of these insights are linked and are referencing a specific contribution and a specific contributor. This means that we can map all of these relations and how people and users are specifically benefiting from the contributions. And not only are we able to map it, but everyone is able to map it because this information lives on chain. And then lastly, funders are able to create with this information, funders are able to create tailored funder strategy. Through this, they can make better incentives out there for the people that belong to their ecosystems, or even just for the type of contributions that they would like to see more of in their own spaces, whether it's a project, or it's a community. Uh, and therefore, they are also going to be able to get a better return on their investment. So on our platform, funders are able to filter the insights that have been provided by users based on the user attributes that are relevant to them. Probably if I'm a funder that is looking to grow a particular ecosystem, or I want to see more people using a specific DAP, a, sp a specific application, I probably only care about the people that are in that space. Maybe I only want to see comments and information that have been generated by person, people that have a very specific profile. So through our platform, we're able to draw on these attributes. We're also able to generate some of those of the attributes from the users based on information that they are willing to share from their emails. And we are enabling funders to remove the noise so that they are able to make better decisions. And on the data side, this information is linked and referenced. So through the whole process, we're enabling traceability of who's benefiting from what are the attributes that these people have so that we know as we're looking at funding decisions, as we're looking at proving our strategies, are we actually reaching the target audience that we want to, that we want to generate impact for? Should we make any changes? And then we're also able to surface other additional data. Maybe we're generating impact for a very particular audience that we were not expecting to be providing either services or any benefits for. And we can then incorporate that as well into the strategies that we're building. 
So if you're interested in exploring how to get started in generating your own verifiable data and use it to improve your own strategies, or you want to talk about the technology that is enabling this process, please feel free to reach out and we'd definitely like to hear from you. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Okay, we're going to move into the Q&A portion of the session. Let's start with Raymond. Raymond, how do we sustainably support this ecosystem of impact evaluation? Yeah, this is something that we thought about a lot. And one of the things that when we first started, one of the first things that we were asked by the, some of our supporters was like, are you going to turn this into a proprietary business, right? There's a clear business proposition where but you have some data, uh, you can tell that data, you can tell those insights to funders, there's probably some value to this. And while that's like a model that seems to work and, and seems to make sense, that seems pretty antithetical to what we wanted to do was to really transform the way that we do intelligence for open source software. And we wanted to build this following the open source ethos as well. I think there's there. what open source has shown is that like when you provide the power of doing things in the open, um, because open source software is significantly easier to fork and change to your use case. It's significantly easier to integrate. Um, it's significantly easier to build a community of people who are collectively building something more robust together. That turns to be something that's really powerful and ends up winning in, in the long run. So that's ultimately, that's been true for operating systems. That's been true for databases. And we wanted to move from business intelligence model, which typically assumes that you have your own isolated data warehouse with your own proprietary data to one where we can have effectively network intelligence or public intelligence, where we are collectively gathering data, transforming that data, massaging it and creating useful publicly available metrics for everyone. So I think from that perspective, I think one of the, one of the tests here is to see if the open source model can apply to open data set and open data infrastructure, similarly to what it has for open source software. So some of the things that we are experimenting with are, for example, like a nonprofit software foundation model, where we can have the folks that depend on this data collectively help contribute to stewarding and sustaining this common, this data commons that we can collectively leverage together. Another model that we are exploring, hopefully with some partners is to see if we can provide not to sell the data, again, the data that we have is publicly available, but to provide some auxiliary services in and around that data that, that could be useful. That's just for us personally. I think I truly believe that one of the reasons why I care about open source software is because it seems to be like one of the ultimate testaments to we are significantly more powerful and we're significantly more influential and impactful when we do these things together. And I want to see if we can make that work on a data side as well. And I'm hoping that it has some secondary side benefits as well. By doing these things in the public and being able to see the exact provenance of where this metric came from, where this data came from, um, hopefully we can sidestep some of the common pitfalls that you would see in traditional closed model. For example, we've seen recently in the voluntary carbon markets, when you do impact measurement in a closed way or with some kind of centralized governance, it can potentially lead to issues such as fraud or issues such as misclassification. And hopefully by doing these things in the open, we can avoid some of these issues and be able to resolve better. Thank you so much for that, Raymond. If there are any funders on the call, it'd be great to get your questions in the chat as well. Um, these are short demos, but funders from traditional philanthropy foundations or program officers, I suspect there, there might be some interesting question from you all about this very digital first approach to impact measurement. Ken, we've got a question for you. How do you know that you can trust the evaluators? Good question. My, and the short answer is inherently you don't, especially when we open up the world, or like when we open up the, the whole blockchain ecosystem, anybody can create an account, anybody can make any statement as long as they have enough resources available to put any of these statements on our blockchain. Similarly, uh, how we, how you do this in like a social environment, you have people you trust, right? You have expert, you know, some people have expertise, some people that you trust based on their credentials. You have some people that you know that have a lot of experience doing certain things, and this is why you trust them more easily at least, but it doesn't make, it doesn't make them right. It only gives them like a head start compared to anybody else. What we, what I always 
try to argue for is that you need to build systems where nobody's locked into that system. So if you want to enable evaluators, then you need to make a system that anybody can be an evaluator and that anybody can contest the evaluator that everybody else is trusting and that they're, that they won't be like, taken out of the conversation simply because they're not this trusted person. You would even have the option. And I think this also alludes to the open source software ethos. If you don't agree, you create a fork and you build your own thing. It's maybe a big statement or maybe it's really difficult, but you could also add the functionality that you need, or you can add the information that you're looking for. For instance, in, in the hypersource perspective, I would use open source observer. I would use the impact metrics guarding and, and maybe a third source. And then suddenly you have, you have three collaborating, but independent organizations that are testing to the same point. And then you go, oh, but this makes sense. Even though this expert says no. Or maybe somebody says, oh, but trust me, I'm an expert. So I think it's important, like in short, I think it's important that you realize that you cannot just trust everybody on their pretty green eyes and that you need to have a system where you can always challenge what they're saying. And if you cannot challenge them, I think that's a red flag. Right on. Trust. Don't trust and verify. Very excellent. April had a question. It was a, a, a very first step question. And the question, and this is for anyone, any speaker can take this one. It's what is the first step to start starting measuring impact? Anyone can take it. And of course, there's different approaches, but popcorn, maybe Lao Namu, if you, you're open to taking it, that would be awesome. Yes. Can you learn? Absolutely. And this is a question that I actually really, because I think, and based on the work that I've done for some of you with several NGOs, like the first step to start measuring the impact that you're having, I'd say is to clearly define what is the goal that you want to have but beyond what is the output that you're putting out there is what is the outcome that you would expect to see that you're creating in the world so that you're able to identify how and where you're going to start inserting the measurements that you're making, you want to make by knowing where is it that you want to head into, you know you'll have a much better idea of, okay, is this, what is it that I'm looking for? Am I looking to have more people, for example, more people contributing to open source software? So maybe I'm going to start looking at how many developers are joining this ecosystem, how many people are contributing to specific libraries. So I think it's very relevant to first, for organizations to first think about what is it that they are trying, what is the impact that they are trying to generate? What is the goal, what's their North star so that they can start working backwards from there on if this is our North star. And this is the process that we're following. Where do we insert measurements? What do these measurements look like? Do these measurements actually link to the goal that we're trying to reach? Or should we think of redefining what's being measured? Thank you so much. Thanks for that. We've got one from Eli, our co-producer here. He asks, and anyone can grab this as well. Can you explain the concept of retroactive funding and how it differs from the traditional funding models that most nonprofits use, like monthly giving or grants awarded by foundation? Anyone want to take that? I can also take that. And I think everyone can provide some insight into that one. But retroactive funding is a method that's become very popular in the blockchain space. It's actually not a new thing. I think one example that's going to be very familiar for everyone is this is what the Nobel Prizes are about. So people do work, it could be for several years, it could be just for a certain amount of months. And then once that work is years after this work has completed, it's evaluated, people measure how impactful has it been. For example, in the Nobel Prizes, how impactful has it been for society? And they rank those, the impact that these projects have had, and then they decide this is the person that's getting the Nobel Prize. And you're not, you're getting it not for promises of future work, but you are getting it based on what is the impact that your contributions or that your work has on society. So what this leads us to is it's much better to decide after the things have happened what was actually impactful. Instead of trying to predict if something is going to generate an impact 
for the specific audience that we wanted to. So instead of trying to gamble with the odds and then amassing information that enables us to predict and project into the future and increase the probabilities of things happening, we're looking backwards and saying, okay, what actually happened and what was the impact that this thing have, this thing had. And then based on that, make an assessment of how much funding they should receive for the contribution. It's also very interesting because how it's being used in the blockchain space is we're also taking a step away from we're giving you funds only for the amount of work, say like the human labor required to do it or resources that you need in order to generate that specific output. But what's being evaluated is how impactful was this. So maybe you needed a little bit amount of time because you're really efficient, you're highly specialized in what you're doing, but the impact that your contribution had on a particular software, on a particular ecosystem was huge. We're not only going to be rewarding you for the amount of time that you put into generating that, but we're rewarding you for all of the benefit that your contribution enabled in the ecosystem, which may be much larger. It's also in this sense, it enables on the one side, it enables funders to ensure that their funds are going to things that actually generated an impact and not trying to predict the future in terms of things are going to be done and if they're actually going to generate an impact. And then on the other side, they also push, they also incentivize one, people just to do work in the ecosystem and two, for people that are doing this work to try and maximize the impact that they are generating instead of say the number of hours that they are putting into a project. Totally makes sense. We've got one, we've got one more minute for one more question. This one's from Kay uh, for Ken. Hypercerts. Uh, Ken uh, Kay says, I wonder if you have thought about issuing accreditations like some associations do for schools and universities. It seems you have the basic standards and quotes uh, and have lined up people who could virtually visit from time to time and renew certifications or accredita accreditation. What do you think, Ken? Yeah, this is a, a question that pops up frequently. This is something that we can enable, and I know that people are working on this. For instance, there's a really interesting organization in Taiwan, Gov Zero, that's trying to experiment with hypercerts. The reason why you will want to do this is because I have a bachelor's degree and it's in paper in storage somewhere. So if it's rain, the rain is gone and I live in a relatively stable country, but if that's not the case, then there's a very strong case that I no longer have my credentials. And suddenly I'm, which is very, I think everybody can see the problems here. There, there are though a bunch of standards that work on digital verifiable credentials, digital identities and digital credentials. I wouldn't say that hypersearch will be the prime candidate for storing these kinds of information. I think that's my answer, my answer, but it's possible. Yeah. We are at the top of the hour. I want to thank our esteemed speakers for taking the time to spend with us today. Aureen, thank you so much. I'm funding the Commons and the crew for co-producing this. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one.